Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's service. Although we're unable to assemble as we usually would, we meet together in spirit with hearts and minds joined in worship. It is my honour and privilege to send warm greetings from the General Assembly of Unitarian and Free Christian Churches in my capacity as its Vice President. Our denomination comprises 160 congregations, all of whom send you their best wishes, and this is especially true of my own congregation in Bury, Greater Manchester, and of the congregations in Aberdeen, Plymouth and Kendal, the furthest points north, south and west in this country that I have visited during the past year or so. The Newcastle area completes the geography as it is the furthest point east that I hold, whilst carrying out more than 50 official engagements between April 2019 and April 2020. I visited the Church of the Divine Unity in Newcastle in February this year in the teeth of Storm Kira and enjoyed meeting the congregation there in what was, as it happened, one of my last official engagements before lockdown. All of us are the important people of the GA, whether we operate within our own churches or in the wider Unitarian sphere. This is where we worship in freedom, exercising our right to follow where individual conscience and integrity dictate. This is where we belong and where we are at home. Thank you for inviting me to conduct your service this morning. If I could be with you in person, I would, but sadly this isn't possible at present. Hopefully, better times are ahead. The theme of today's service is courage in adversity. So remember the first words in our opening music, nothing is possible. And at this point, it's not a very good link, I'm afraid, I'd like to thank Diana for her help and support with the technical side of this service. And now I'll light our chalice candle and say a few words. Thank God for allowing you to see another day. No matter what, keep trusting, keep believing, be strong, have hope. Although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming of it. Life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass, it's about to dance in the rain. Be patient, all storms pass. The sunshine will come and there will be joy. And now we're going to sing our first hymn, which is, if you're following it in the hymn book, uh, number one, four. And now let us pray. Let us pray not for certainties and sureness and facts but for the strength to bear uncertainty, doubt and wondering. Let us pray for peace of mind in these turbulent times. Let us pray that we can become aware enough of what is constant so that we can bear what is not. Let us pray for patience that we might endure these times of unknowing and not become frustrated. Let us pray for hope that we might look forward to happier days when we will all be free to meet as one again. And let us pray for faith, that we might feel held, supported and loved by all those, human and spiritual, on whom we are relying in these days of uncertainty. Let us pray for those who are ill and those who are experiencing loneliness and fear. And let us pray for all those who are working hard, courageously and lovingly, to support and comfort those amongst us who need it most. Love never fails. Even in the darkest moments, love gives hope. Love compels us to fight against the coronavirus alongside our sisters and brothers living in poverty. Love compels us to stand together in prayer with our neighbours near and far. Now it is clear that our futures are bound together more tightly than ever before 
as we pray in our individual homes around the country and around the world, we are united as one family. So let us pause and find a moment of peace as we lift our hearts in prayer. You may wish at this point for a few moments to remember the members of your Newcastle and Stockton Church communities together or individually and to think lovingly of all those dear to you. And let us remember, especially today, Edna Anderson and her daughter Marion Kelly of Stockton and keep memories of them and thoughts of those close to them in our thoughts and prayers. Let us now enter into a period of silence. Let our prayers, spoken and unspoken, be heard and granted. Amen. And now, a short story. It had been raining heavily for days, and one man, mindful of the story of Noah, decided that a second flood was imminent. He took himself off to the top of Blackpool Tower, out of danger. Soon after he arrived, two policemen came to rescue him, but he refused, saying, The Lord will provide. He will save me. Later, a naval dinghy appeared but the man refused to climb in. Later still, a helicopter hovered above for him to climb into, but he declined this assistance too. Eventually, the man, thoroughly frightened by this time, shouted out in panic and despair, Lord, I'm going to drown, please save me. And God, in some exasperation, shouted back to him, I've sent you the police, the Navy and the Air Force. How much more help do you expect? It's a reminder that God will always support us when we're in need, even if we don't realise it at the time. But we have to make our own effort too, without necessarily waiting for others to help us. Many of you will know of Frank Gardner, the BBC's security correspondent. He is 58 years old, holds a degree from the University of Exeter, specialises in Middle Eastern matters, speaks fluent Arabic, and at one point was a director of the Robert Fleming Bank, based in the Middle East. He is a major in the regular army reserve and the territorial army, and a keen skier and bob skier. In 2004, he was shot at point-blank range in Saudi Arabia by Islamist gunmen. Despite making an amazing recovery from this attack, he remains paralysed in his lower body. He will be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. I have recently read one of Frank's books, Blood and Sand, which I recommend partly because it is a masterly commentary, very accessibly written, on Middle East affairs, events leading up to 9-11, and what he called the phenomenon that is Al-Qaeda. During his time in the Middle East, Frank was particularly impressed by the more remote places, small towns and smaller villages, where he was unfailingly welcomed with kindness and generosity. The hospitality he received, even from people who possessed practically nothing, was willingly and unstintingly offered. Frank's Middle East passion dominated, but nearly ended his life. What interested me most were the sections of the book which dealt with the attack on Frank, his terrible injuries, his path to recovery, and the rebuilding of his life. I must stress here that Frank has not made a full recovery, nor will he. When the Queen conferred his OBE on him in 2005, she asked him if he had recovered, a question frequently put to him by friends and well-wishers. His reply to the Queen was typical of his down-to-earth attitude. No, ma'am, I think this is about as good as it gets. On June the 6th, 2004, Frank and his cameraman Simon were ambushed by gunmen. Simon was killed outright. Frank was shot 11 times and left for dead. The two men, 
were attacked because they were Europeans, spotted by extremist jihadists. Frank wrote, looking back on the actual fact of his shooting, that he had been lucky. And it's amazing how often that word crops up amongst people who have experienced extreme circumstances in their lives. He was lucky not to have been killed. Lucky that the governor of Riyadh ordered a team of top surgeons from one of the best equipped hospitals in the world to look after him. Even luckier that a South African gunshot wound specialist surgeon, Peter Bouts, was currently working in Riyadh. Peter's expertise and the high-tech equipment he was able to access saved Frank's life. He wasn't quite so lucky in that the promised compensation from the South government never materialised, or that of the group of gunmen who attacked him, only one was ever brought to justice. And then, not until 2016, 12 years after the event. I will spare you the harrowing details of Frank's treatment, recovery, and return to what had to pass for normal life. It took the best part of a year for him to be discharged from hospital, a period during which he was constantly in very severe pain, when one operation followed another and the fear of infection was ever present. Frank writes of his ordeal, what I remember most is the terrible feeling of loneliness, the sense that I couldn't rely on anyone to help me. His instinct for self-preservation and thoughts of his wife and daughters kept him alive. Despite the paralysis of his lower body, he still suffered constant pain in his legs and feet, which later made it impossible for him to sit in a wheelchair for longer than an hour or two at a time. It took a visit to a local restaurant where he was taken from hospital by friends to make him realise that he was permanently disabled. The waiter gently pointed out that from Frank's seat there was no access to disabled toilets. Frank's immediate reaction was to wonder why he was being given the information until realisation dawned. When it was finally established that there was little possibility of his ever walking again, he admitted that it was one of the most depressing hours of his life. He was terrified at the prospect of being confined to a wheelchair, of not being able to live the life he had been used to and still wanted. In order to build his life, he had to sell his home and move to a house better adapted to his needs. He was fitted with special calipers so that he could attempt to walk. He acquired a special walking frame so that he would appear to be standing when he delivered his news reports. He learned to project his voice upwards so that when he was sitting in his wheelchair, he could be heard by people standing around and above him. He had to bring himself to the point at which he accepted that he was paraplegic and crippled for life and that although he was able to return to his BC job, he lacked stamina to work long, strenuous hours, and travelling abroad spontaneously belonged to the past. Journeys, especially abroad, had to be meticulously planned. Medication, space for his wheelchair, toilet access, his inability to sit for long periods, all these and other considerations had to be resolved in advance. But what emerges from Frank's writings is that he is not angry with his attackers, nor does he feel self-pity. His mantra was always that he would make his new life work. He could rediscover the love of life that had made every day worth living. He would rise to the challenge and work his way through his problems. Frank's account is inspirational. In such circumstances, how many of us would simply give up, sit in a corner and decide that there was no point in continuing? Life as we knew it was over. Most of us are not great achievers, famous and revered in our own spheres, but nobody is immune from accidents, illness, disease, the loss of those close to us and other myriad problems that beset us, as our present circumstances demonstrate all too clearly. It is how we tackle our problems that matters, 
we can just give up or we can determine to fight to develop some positive aspect of what has occurred we choose this route there are no guarantees that it will be easy but a flexible attitude can be of tremendous help I am frequently surprised to see what courage in the face of adversity, adversity can achieve in people like us who would usually be termed ordinary. They acquire stature and dignity as they set about raising vast amounts of money for charity or tackle local authorities about changes in regulations to improve conditions or take on the might of politicians, the government and the courts as they strive for major change legislation. If we believe that a motive force exists in this world, which some people call God, this will help us to stay strong, focused and positive, well on the way to achieving whatever targets we have set ourselves. Our story shows that God is present and ready to help. Once we acknowledge that we are usually more supported than we know, this may fortify us further. Whilst we continue to struggle under the current restrictions that bound us, we need to remember that there is more at stake than our own needs. We isolate ourselves in order to prevent a rampant infection from spreading and destroying. We consider others and our country, our world even, first and foremost. We make our own contributions, helping as we can by staying in touch with family and friends, by sending them our encouragement and love, by supporting them in their dis-ease and despair. This time will pass and we will emerge from it, I hope, stronger, kinder and more th thoughtful than before, into a world which has become strangely unfamiliar. What we then make of it is our choice. Let us not allow depression to take control. If we focus on what we can do, not on what we used to do, we have the power to succeed. May it be so. And now our closing words, which will be followed straight on with the closing music, which is Elgar's Land of Hope and Glory. Let us pray. May we be good and wise beyond our thoughts. May we accept that we are sometimes led in ways that we do not comprehend. In times of perplexity and panic, let us maintain our confidence that all will be well, instead of succumbing to despair. Let us work with trustful spirits, supported and encouraged by guidance not necessarily of this world. Make us patient in trouble, steadfast when uncertainty exists and courageous in resolving the conflicts of life. And may we all live in peace and love all the days of our lives. Amen. <laughs>